just uh, before we get started, the way we're going to do this, uh, anybody wants to get up here and tell some stories or about Jim or uh, just go over some of his favorite jokes or something he said to make you laugh, by all means, just uh, help yourself. Just uh, talk to me when I'm off stage and we'll just uh, set up a line and you guys can just have at it. Does that sound okay with you? All right. Yeah. yeah. I, I first met Jim in uh, 1978 in Eunice, Louisiana. We were working on a little bitty radio. I was working on a little bitty radio station and he was the new guy. Walked in the control room, he introduced himself, he sat down, he started pulling cigarettes out of his pocket. I mean, packages of cigarettes. He pulled three packs of cigarettes out of one pocket, and they were all different kinds. There was like Marlboro Regulars, some Winston 100 Lights, and a pack of Salem's. I'd never seen anything like it. It was like some R.J. Reynolds version of the Kellogg's Variety Pack. <laughs> well, this cat marches to the tune of the temperature. <laughs> I, uh, I was talking to him just a couple of weeks ago, and we were just talking about career stuff. And I think the thing he was most proud of was the fact that he had gone this long in life without ever having a real job. <laughs> and with, with I guess, 40-something years without ever having to resort to physical labor to make a living. <laughs> he actually bragged he was 47 years old and had never pulled a muscle. <laughs> That's pretty damn impressive. <laughs> I, I just wrote down a little list of a couple of things here. Jim was, uh, the thing about him that I thought was really unusual, unusual. One, of the, one of the things about him that was unusual, he was either really, really good at something or was the absolute worst you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> He's probably the best bowler I've ever seen. Yeah and the worst golfer. <laughs> I mean, the abs I gave him a set of clubs and almost took them back. <laughs> I, you know, a lot of people probably don't know this. Jim uh, uh, considered a professional bowling career. He was in high school. He was, uh, he carried about, what, a 280, 280-something average. Not quite, not quite. No? Uh, two, 210 or something. 210. 300. In that case, he made the right decision. <laughs> 280 would have been, uh, been a lot better. Uh, I was talking to Bill the other day, and Bill said uh, he actually had people wanting to sponsor him. He had some guys wanting to back him on a professional bowling uh, tour. Nobody knows why he didn't pursue that career. Maybe it was the you know uh, hours of practice <laughs> of them or the rigors of competition. Possibly pulling a muscle. Muscle. Possibly a muscle pull. <laughs> I uh, I think it was a food poisoning from the bowling alley snack bar. You've been to the long point. Yes, I have. You, you figure you got to figure they'd have changed the grease in the deep fryer had they known an entire career was hanging in the balance. <laughs> Uh, the last game Jim ever bowled was uh, was in Florida, right before he, he lived in Florida for a couple of months before he uh, before he moved back to uh, to Houston. Ten pin lanes, uh, right off of St. Pete Beach. He bowled a 300. That was the last game he ever bowled, in. and this is really strange. It was actually uh, a charity benefit for another comic who uh, had liver disease. I'm sorry, it was kidney disease. <laughs> kidney disease. Steve Harry. I just thought that was, last year he was in Florida. We drove by Ten Pin Lane. He was telling me that. And, and, and he said, you know, that was a, it was a charity for uh, for Steve Eric, who actually was going through the same thing Jim was going through. Uh, he played golf one time in his life that I know of. That was in a comics open. Um, he had a set of my clubs. We were riding in the same cart. We get the first, we start playing the first hole. He gets out of the cart. He says, what should I hit? I said, well, hit your six iron. He hits and gets back in the cart. We drive up a little farther. What should I, I tell him? Second hole. He says, uh, what should I hit? I said, well, hit your six iron. He comes back from the cart. He says, uh, there's no six iron. Yeah, there is. You just hit it on the last hole. He goes back, looks in the back. I'm telling you, there's no six iron. I get out of the car, go around the back, and look in his bag. After he was swinging the golf club, he was taking it and putting it back in the bag, club head first. <laughs> there was nothing but shaft sticking out of the bag. Now, if you don't know how to put the club back in the bag, what are the odds you're going to be any good at that game? Uh, Jim was the uh, probably the best interviewer 
on the radio that uh, that I've ever heard, and the worst board operator. <laughs> we had Kiss on the air with it. One of the first days we were in Nashville, uh, the rock band Kiss was in, and Gene Simmons of Kiss is notorious for having a tongue like a lizard. And Jim asked him, he said, uh, exactly how long is your tongue? And Gene Simmons said, well, it's long enough to do anything I need to do with it. And Jim said, well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that, because um, I dropped a cracker down in this crack. <laughs> so hard when the, when the band left they were getting in their limo he started we, were, we could see him out the window he got back out of the limo and came back in and was still laughing and shook Jim shook Jim's hand again to tell him how funny that was and how much he enjoyed being on the air with him uh, when he was in uh, when he was living in Eunice at this uh, 250 watt radio station you guys know the punchline my hair dryer has <laughs> On weekends, we'd have this rotating schedule, and uh, whoever got stuck with the early Saturday morning schedule, it was, it was awful. You'd have to get there at 5 o'clock in the morning and just run the board for two hours. There was a live show in French from a bar in Mamou. It was all in French, and about every 10 or 15 minutes, the host of the show, when he had run out of shit to talk about, would say, uh, let's throw it back to the station for some good Cajun music. And we were supposed to spin some record or some, you know, ridiculous Cajun song. It was about 5.30 in the morning and Jim falls asleep on the board and he, he wakes up and there's dead air. There's nothing on the air. So he figures they've sent it back to him for some music. So he cranks up some, I mean, some ridiculously loud, obnoxious Zydeco. And in the background he hears a guy going, no, 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 Chef, turn that down. We're having a moment of silence for the dead Malfa brother. <laughs> was the best at getting a date and the worst dresser I've ever seen in my life. He got a date on a wrong number one time. Somebody called the house, it was the wrong number. He said, I'm sorry, you had the wrong number. But hey, you sound pretty cute. Why, you might be my type. Our, uh, our first day in Nashville for radio at uh, WKDF, we, uh, we were going to sign a contract that night. We had to go by the station to pick up paperwork and some keys or something. We walked in the front door, and the receptionist uh, looked at us and said, uh, Are y'all here to paint the tower? <laughs> and Jim looked at me and said, we got to start dressing better. <laughs> Incidentally, when we left Nashville, we, we went to Chicago for a year. When we uh, left Nashville, they threw a big party for us at, some, at uh, uh, one of our friends' houses, and the receptionist showed up, and she gave us a can of paint to take with us <laughs> on our way out. <laughs> um, my dad died about eight years ago, a little over eight years ago. Jim was a pallbearer at my dad's funeral, and he, uh, God bless him, he, he stopped and bought a suit on his way. The, the funeral was in Louisiana. He stopped somewhere and bought a suit to wear at my dad's funeral. I was very impressed that, that Jim owned a suit. <laughs> and, and also that he went to the, all that trouble to buy one for my dad's funeral. Well, he gets to the church and he's walking down. I had to grab him and my sister took some scissors out of her purse to cut the price tag <laughs> from under the arm. And he said, that's supposed to be like that. This is that new mini pearl line of men's <laughs> Patterson. <laughs> he had the best electronic equipment and the worst car you'd ever seen. In life. He was the first guy I ever knew that had a VCR. He, he bought a, a, a VCR in 1980 or 81, and it was the size of a small refrigerator. It was a top loader. <laughs> I don't think there were any buttons on it. There were a lot of knobs you had to turn. I don't know how that damn thing worked. It was it was almost as heavy as that damn Fender Rhodes that, that he had. Still has in the garage somewhere. 
Uh, as far as he, oh, he, he was the first person I ever knew with a video camera. Uh, first, per, he was, you know, he was always buying the latest electronic gadget and loading it up in the shittiest car you've ever seen anybody <laughs> drive. <down. laughs>